In this video, we're going to look at Mattel stock and try to identify whether it is a buy or a sell. I'll play a little snippet of this interview with Kramer and the Mattel CEO. All right, let's talk about Barbie. How did Barbie have a year of growth that you probably, I don't know when the last time Barbie grew like this, and what did you do to make it so that Barbie had more appeal? Well, Barbie did phenomenally well. Not only it grew 10% in revenue, it actually increased 35% in consumer demand. Barbie performed well across the board. It's really about great product, new innovation, cultural relevance, effective demand creation, and original content that we created that continues to drive demand. Barbie was the number one toy property in the U.S. for five consecutive weeks, according to NPD. Mattel is a toy manufacturing company founded in 1945. The products and brands it produces include Fisher-Price, Barbie, Hot Wheels, Matchbox, and many more. The company sells products in more than 150 countries. It is the world's second largest toy maker behind Lego. Mattel is a combination of the founders' names, Matt and Elliot. In January 2017, Mattel named former Google executive Margot Georgiadis as CEO. She only lasted 15 months. At the time of her departure, Mattel stock had gone down 50% during her tenure. Enon Kreis is the current CEO. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company. Market cap is $4.9 billion. That's the value of the company according to the stock market and the trading at $14.15 a share. And to get shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding, $347 million. Let's look at their financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows, then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So if a company has positive free cash flow, it makes it a lot easier for them to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things, and if it does those things, it might need to do it with debt. So this company has positive free cash flow in two years, negative free cash flow in two years. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's a revenue minus expenses, and they only have positive net income in 2016 negative in the next three years. Revenue is a sales for the company and each year their sales go down so that doesn't look good. Let's look at their financial statements to figure out why they have so many negatives. So in 2017, 18, and 19 they had negative net income. The top of the income statement is revenue, that's the sales for the company. Below that is the cost of revenue, that's how much money this company spent to generate the revenue. Those are the costs involved in making the products. Like for instance, the rent at the factories, also the payroll for the employees on the front line. The difference between revenue and cost of revenue is gross profit. Below gross profit is operating expenses. These are the expenses that are not directly tied to making the products. Examples are payroll for accounting or payroll for marketing and marketing expenses and depreciation. So you can see in 2017 and 2018, they had negative operating income. So their expenses were higher than the money they brought in. That's generally not what you want to see when you invest in a company because it means a company needs to take on debt just to run its day-to-day -day operations. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, then there's other. So you can see they don't operate too efficiently. They don't have any money left over. So by looking at the income statement, it doesn't look like they're doing a good job running their business. Let's look at the statement of cash flows. Operating cash flow is a better indicator of a company's health because it takes into account the non-cash items on the income statement. The way you calculate operating cash flow, it starts with net income. In 2019, it was negative 213 million. Then it adds back the non-cash items. Because depreciation of $244 million, that was an expense on the income statement, but that was a non-cash item. So it doesn't affect cash flow. So they actually had positive operating cash flow in 2019, not in 2018, 2017. And the way you calculate free cash flow, you start with operating cash flow, then you minus capital expenditures. So they did have positive free cash flow in 2019, which is very important. Not so much in 2018 and 2017. So it seems like the company has lots of plans in place to improve things. So hopefully these numbers will get better. 
Let's look at a capital structure. They have $2.8 billion of debt, half a billion of equity. They pay 7% interest on their debt, so they pay a really high interest rate. They don't pay taxes because they lose money each year. And 85% of that capital structure is debt, so they're really leveraged. 15% is equity. And to get the cost of equity, we use the capital asset pricing model. That's 13.84%. And part of the CAPM formula is the beta. The beta is how volatile the stock is relative to the market. And they have a beta of 1.5, so the stock moves one and a half times the market. So it's a little volatile, it's not too bad. And their WAC is 8.06%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And the WAC is a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's two billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.4 billion. We divide that by 347 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 683. They're trading at 1415, so they're trading at a 107% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them undervalued. They're saying the stock is worth $17.45. Simply Wall Street gets its valuation based off the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. So the stock was trading well over $30 a few years back, but it's kept dropping and it looks like it's at a pretty low point. So a lot depends on how the new CEO executes its plans. The last time this company paid a dividend was in August 2017. The prior CEO from Google decided to cut its dividend to conserve cash. If you invested $10,000 in this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $8,300 today. That's a 16.5% loss or an average annual loss of 1.79%. If you invested $10,000 10 years ago and did not reinvest the dividends, you'd actually come out with a little profit, 1.86% profit. This is from the company's most recent annual report. It talks about the pandemic. It mentions this includes the successful transition to a remote work structure for our employees working in 35 countries globally. And it also mentions the closure of the American Girl retail stores, which can affect the business, obviously. This is from the 10K. It mentions the license agreements with Disney, NBC, Warner Brothers, and some other companies. So you can see Mattel has the ability to leverage other brands to sell more products. It does obviously have to pay a royalty expense for using these brands, but it's well worth it, I feel. Another thing to consider when investing in Mattel is the possible bankruptcy of one of its customers. In 2017, Toys R Us filed bankruptcy. That really affected Mattel's business because Toys R Us sold a lot of Mattel's products. Also, to make the situation even worse, Toys R Us owed Mattel over $30 million that it never paid them because it filed bankruptcy. One third of Mattel's business comes from Walmart and Target. So if either of those companies filed bankruptcy or just stopped carrying Mattel's products, that could really hinder their business. It is good to remember that a company's financial performance is not 100% correlated to the changes in stock price. It can help or hurt the stock price. But the only thing that's correlated to the stock price is supply and demand of the market. If more people want to buy a stock than sell it, the stock price will go up. And if more people want to sell Mattel stock than buy it, the stock price will go down. The market is forward thinking. In the short run, you can't really predict the stock market. But the best way to mitigate these things is to hold a stock for long term and hold it in good solid companies. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average P.E. ratio in the market is 17.3. The median is 15.3. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have a negative P.E. since they have negative net income. The average price of sales is 4.6. The median is 2.0. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. They're at 1.1, so investors are paying $1.10 for $1 revenue. That's a really good ratio. The average price to book is 4.8. The median is 2.3. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. They're at 10.0, so investors are paying $10 for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. The average interest coverage ratio is 12.7. The median is 3.9. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. 
they're only at point two, so they cannot cover their interest payments, which means they may need to take on more debt. Average ROE is 13%, the median is 12%. ROE is net income over equity, then negative since they have negative net income. Average current ratio is 1.8, the median is 1.3. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities, so they can cover their current liabilities, which is great. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash, accounts receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them with similar companies. I've done videos on Nautilus, Planet Fitness, and Six Flags, all in the same industry as Mattel. And if Mattel has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So of course they're worse in PE because they're negative. They have the best price to sales of all the companies, which is interesting to see. They're worse in average and price to book. They're doing fine in current ratio. ROE, every company's negative. In terms of debt, they are worse than average, but two companies have 100% debt. They're at 85%. They're the second largest company of the four, a 4.9 billion market cap, and nobody pays a dividend in this industry. So to summarize, I have them trading at 107% premium. Their ratios and financials look really weak. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or just support the channel, you could become a member by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.